Greetings, everybody. This is a video that, quite frankly, I did not expect to make. You know, I have kind of a projection in my mind what, what books I want to read and what uh, video topics I'd like to cover. And there are a few other video topics I'd like to cover. Uh, I don't want to saturate the market, so to speak, so I, I don't think I want to upload more than one video a week at any point. Um, but the next books that I had in mind, the next topics I wanted to talk about were more things about the antebellum period in the United States. But um, as things happen, you know, uh, something interceded and I found something else that it was interested to talk about. Um, and this is a topic that I've covered a couple times before. Um, education. Education is a very fascinating topic. It's a fascinating topic because it's one of the issues that, you know, people kind of presume that the government needs to be involved in. And there's a lot of uh, debate about how, how things would work in a, in a free society. And that's not the element I want to uh, look at here or examine here. Um, but if you've watched my channel for a long time, you know that I'm also interested in uh, the fact that we really don't have an egalitarian uh, public school system in the United States as it is today. There's clearly a very classist uh, tiered system where you have the vast majority of people are attending public schools, which uh, frankly they do vary quite a bit in, in how effective they are. Um, usually as a reflection of the culture of the society in which they're based. Uh, it's quite erroneous to look at the United, United States and assume that it's a, a homogeneous society culturally uh, or racially for that matter um, and you know then make broad statements about uh, you know the the educational system in it that that ignore that. Um, but then we have a private system uh, which by and large is very similar to the public system. Uh, the quality tends to be slightly better, but pedagogically most private schools are not, you can't really be differentiated from public schools in, in most respects. And then you have some that are different, uh, that, that actually are quite different. Uh, and then, but those would be very small, the most elite private schools, the most elite boarding schools, most of which are in the Northeast, uh, and a few others peppered here and there. Um, and then of course there's homeschooling. But uh, again, I've made videos about this in the past, um, you know, uh, and it's not a topic that, you know, I, I was planning to do a great deal of reading about. Um, but since moving to New Hampshire, I've been exposed to certain elements of the educational system in the United States that I had no exposure to previously, first-hand exposure to anyway. Uh, and uh, it's been quite surprising, you know, what I've learned and, and, and I haven't, I have not done sufficient videos about this. You know, being from the upper Midwest, you know, there's no Ivy League schools in the upper Midwest. There's no elite private schools. There's no boarding schools. Uh, you know, Harvard and Yale and Dartmouth, these are just far away, almost mythical places like Shangri-La uh, or Washington, D.C. or just uh, places that you, you never go and you don't, they're almost not real in a tangible, visceral sense. And, you know, I would never have had any kind of first-hand experience with them. Of course, I went to college, but I went to one of the many uh, public land-grant universities that pe pepper, uh, are peppered across the entire United States. Um, uh, completely different institutions, both in their history and how they work. Um, and once I moved here, you know, my gateway into these institutions was not uh, libertarianism. It wasn't reading. It wasn't John Taylor Gatto as as much as I enjoy John Taylor Gatto and as much as he's been a resource uh, for my study of this topic. Uh, it's been, quite frankly, it's been grinder. Um, where I live is not immediately adjacent to any of these institutions. However, uh, uh, Harvard is about 45 minutes away, 45 miles away. Uh, depending on traffic. Dartmouth is farther, about 60 to 70 miles away. However, Dartmouth is very isolated and most of the guys who go there are very, they're, they're urbanites, they're usually from larger cities and because of their isolation they tend to cast a pretty wide net that not, not infrequently comes as far as where I live. So uh, I've been to Dartmouth on several occasions to meet guys. I know guys from Dartmouth. So I've gone on dates in, Dar in Dartmouth. I've gone on dates now in Harvard uh, multiple times. Uh, I've met guys in Harvard plenty of times. Uh, uh, now Brown University, um, which is another Ivy League school in Rhode Island. Uh, I haven't met anyone at Yale yet, so I have. To, I guess I have to start casting around in, in Connecticut a little bit more. Um, but you know, all these interactions have been very interesting. Uh, talking to these guys have, have been very interesting. I actually had a very fascinating date with this, a guy who actually teaches sociology 
at Harvard who is an avowed communist um, and you know fascinating you know interaction with this guy uh, he of course was aware of my libertarianism uh, and you know we had some very interesting discussions uh, probably should do an entire uh, video about that although it's been several months since I met him um, but you know it, it's been an exposure to a culture uh, a very different culture a very different history a very different zeitgeist than one that I actually knew about and it's one thing to uh, hear about the the elite you know we hear that a lot especially in uh, the cons conspiracy theory circles but even even among libertarian circles you hear about the elite and you know I think that's somewhat of a spurious nebulous artificial you know label it, it, it's hard to say exactly what that means or to define it in a in in such a way that it's really really tangible but there definitely are significant cultural differences uh, not only just being in New England but uh, you know interacting with you know some of the people who are associated with these Ivy League institutions the old money families you know the, the families whose names you might recognize and you know this has been a really fascinating subject but again um, this is about a topic that even I was completely unaware of and it's it has to do with boarding schools now if you're like me board the only the only kind of uh, knowledge you had of boarding schools came from watching uh, the Dead Poets Society growing up and I always thought of boarding schools as essentially um, some mythical thing that happened in the past like uh, that watching a movie about boarding schools was kind of akin to watching a period piece about the Civil War or uh, you know the Great Depression or something. That this was, these were institutions. They they did not exist uh, anywhere near where I was from. I've never met a person who went to one. I've never heard of a person who went to one. Um, and uh, you know it wasn't a topic that I've given a lot of thought to. Uh, John Taylor Gatto has a couple times referenced what he considers the best public schools or excuse me private schools in the country and he usually mentions uh, Groton and Exeter and a few others and I really at no point did I think I should study these or find them that particularly interesting until last week. Uh, last week I received a message from somebody on Grindr and of course it was Grindr the gateway to higher education in the United States and uh, this guy was relatively young he said he was 18 uh, and he was I verified this um, we never met but I was trying to parse out how old he was uh, it's not uncommon for guys on Grindr who are younger than 18 to lie and say that they are so you'll have uh, 15 16 17 year olds who will say that they're 18 when indeed they're not um, and uh, he said that he uh, was in Concord which is only about 15 miles away, uh, very close to where I live, and uh, he said that he went to school, and I was trying to establish what school he went to, if he was in high school or if he was in college. There are a couple universities up there, or at least um, technical schools, and so I would asked him if he went to the New Hampshire Institute of Technology, and he said no, he goes to SBS, SPS, uh, and I guess he assumed that I would know what that meant, and I of course didn't, so I said what is SPS, and he says it's St. Or sorry, St. Paul's School. St. Paul's School. So, you know, I chatted with this guy. He seemed like a nice guy. He's definitely very cute. Uh, and while I was chatting with him, I went ahead and did a Google search on St. Paul's School. Little did I know, St. Paul's School is one of those schools that could lay claim to being the best, most exclusive uh, private school, boarding school in the United States. Uh, if you look at the list of alums, it's quite an impressive list. Uh, even going back, the school was founded in the late 1850s. Uh, we have J.P. Morgan, the John Jacob Astor, and we have the Aldrich families. For those of you who don't know, the Aldrich family are the people who, uh, the, the senators who worked for the Rockefellers who did so much to pass the Glass-Steagall, or uh, no, I'm sorry, the Owen Stanley. The, basically the Fed, you know, he's the senator who got the Fed passed. Uh, his kids went there. He may have also went there, and more recently, John Kerry went there. Uh, so this is an elite institution. It costs uh, roughly forty thousand dollars a year to attend in tuition. Uh, the actual cost per student is twice that. Uh, the endowment for the school uh, averages about a million dollars per student. They have about five hundred kids at the school, um, so they're expending about eighty thousand dollars a year on kids. Most classes have about 10, 10 pupils per one teacher. Sometimes it's as few as one teacher per one 
a student that's for a class. Um, so it is an elite boarding school. They all live there. They wear uniforms. Uh, the main dining room is called the Harry Potter room because it is as large and ornate as the um, fictional um, dining hall at Hogwarts as is depicted in the Harry Potter movies. It used to be called a different name. Uh, once they started getting students who were young enough to watch the Harry Potter movies, their, their uh, impression was always to call this place the Harry Potter room. I haven't seen pictures, but that's the description. Um, so I thought this was pretty interesting. You know, here is this this element of society that I was almost completely unaware of uh, to the point of almost thinking it was imaginary or mythical and yet all of a sudden this member of this elite uh, organization group uh, culture is you know want, wants to get very personal uh, and just to you know head off any speculation I've not met this person and very likely I won't uh, but went ahead and found a book on the topic actually it's called Privilege the Making of an Adolescent Elite at St. Paul's School by Seamus Raman Khan. And an explanation of his name, his uh, father is Pakistani and his mother is Irish, hence the Seamus and the Khan. Um, and this guy went to St. Paul's School, uh, then he be, went to Harvard, which about a third of the students who graduate from St. Paul's School go to Harvard, and most of the rest go to a combination of the other Ivy League schools, uh, Dartmouth, Yale, Brown, uh, Wesleyan, and uh, Clinton College, and the only like public school on there is University of Pennsylvania is the only one that draws any, it seems like. Um, uh, incredible, a third go to Harvard. Um, and this guy was an alum. He's now a sociology professor uh, in Columbia, or at least he was at the time this book was published in, I think, 2011. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not a long book, and it, was, and it was a very interesting look into this particular school, although he does talk about other schools and how they're similar and how they're different. Um, now, I will say this guy is, uh, as you might expect for a, a sociology professor from the Ivy League, uh, although he never says it, uh, obviously a Marxist. Uh, he speaks in terms of class, he speaks in terms of race, uh, he speaks in terms of inequality constantly. Um, I kept wanting to pull my hair out and say this guy needs to read Thomas Sowell, uh, and I haven't done a review, but Thomas Sowell's most recent book is amazing. It's my favorite Thomas book so far. I haven't read all of his books, so I can't say it's the best one that I've ever that, that he's ever written, but it's the best one that I've ever read um, about uh, wealth and inequality in the world. Uh, I think a synthesis of you know the analysis this guy gives and Thomas Sowell would yield uh, much better results than this guy kind of comes to. But it was still very interesting. Um, his read on what they teach at a school like this, what they convey. Um, he even references creating a class, which is another book that I read about how elite universities uh, select students. Uh, and to sum it up here, as I've I think I've already done, uh, Ivy League schools, in a lot of ways, they're not conveying an education to people. You, when you take a math class at Harvard, it's not going to likely be any more difficult or substantially more difficult or or uh, ultimate compared to any number of other math classes you can take at other universities, you know, at the University of Tennessee or Southern California or the University of Chicago or who knows, even a community college could have a calculus teacher that's that much harder. It's, it's, it's entirely possible. Um, what they do convey, however, is status. Um, status is very difficult to pin down, but it's, it's one of the main things that we vie for in life. You know, we want sex, we want food, but status can yield both of these things. And it's very, very intangible. Uh, now, in a feudal society, historically, with monarchies and uh, with a landed uh, aristocracy, you have a, you have status that's by birth. Well, you're a great guy. You you have status because your father has status. This is in our more individualistic times and anti-feudal times. Uh, not really possible anymore. It's not enough to have, you can have money, you can inherit money easily enough and that's fine, um, but you don't necessarily have inherit status. So, uh, you know, the wealthy families of New England basically had to find a way to convey status onto their children um, that had legitimacy. You know, they can't, it's not enough for, you know, the Aldriches to just say, hey, our kids are great. 
uh, because they're the Aldriches, we're going to give them the Aldrich Award or the Rockefeller Award. Uh, they need something that will lend legitimacy to this. And so uh, establishing and patronizing universities and elite schools that will convey this is how they do it. Now, it can't be directly obvious, and I'm not suggesting that this is a direct like conspiracy, but these schools very much rely on subject, uh, subjective um, evaluations of character and of ability and of worth. Uh, Harvard in particular, this is fairly well known actually, uh, it's not based on academics per se. It, it's not a place for the smartest person at math, the smartest person at that. There might be some of those people who go there, but that's not exactly what they're looking for. Um, they used to have a problem with lots of Jews going to these schools, and that's when they explicitly started to look less at uh, grades and more at character, which is very nebulous. And of course, what are the things they decided that were the most redeeming characteristics? Well, it was the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant virtues. When, to be honest, like I'm not saying all those virtues are bad things. Um, you know, having a nice physique, uh, be, and that's that's actually honestly that sounds stupid. Uh, it sounds, um, you know, very superficial, but like, honestly, people who look good, who have nice bodies, uh, who have good physical forms, who, you know, you look at them and you're like, yeah, that could be like, that could, that became, could be a Greek statue. That could be a bronze that somebody made that form. Uh, they like that. Someone, uh, who is an entrepreneur or who runs a charity. It's not somebody who just gets good grades. Uh, and they look for that. Well, these elite boarding schools cater to produce kids who are like that. Um, St. John's School requires all students not to take gym, they don't have gym classes, but to play a sport. Uh, they have to compete in sports all through except for their senior year. I think because they become busy enough for their senior year, they don't require it, but most kids do anyway. Uh, St. Paul's has over a hundred extracurricular clubs, whether it be a robotics club or an astronomy club, a uh, linguistics club, um, different types of humanities, all kinds of clubs, hockey club, uh, that if you go there and by the time you're a senior and the senior class is about 100, 150 kids, and they don't call them seniors, by the way, they have different names to kind of distinguish themselves from everyone else. They call it forms. Uh, so like a senior would be a sixth form, I think, or maybe an eighth form. I think it's a sixth form. Um, you, and what this means is that uh, you, basically every senior can become the head of a certain organization. You know, they can be the head of the robotics club or the astronomy club or the math club um, or the multicultural club or whatever. And when they are applying to university, when they're applying to Harvard, uh, they can, uh, you know, point that out. And uh, so the, the schools are basically tailor-made to uh, get these kids there. Now, the kids are kind of imbibed with this notion that the reason that they excel is is because they work hard and uh, you know they're exceptional uh, because of their hard work and uh, that's the reason that they go to Harvard and, and most other people don't. Um, of course, this is a little bit uh, unjustified because you know most people are never going to go to a boarding school like this most people don't have forty thousand dollars to go to a boarding school like this um, they don't go to a school that can give them uh, a club for every single person who can afford to do that you know who can afford a robotics club and its own strong I mean they have their own there they have their uh, own planetarium and um, what's the word I feel like an idiot for not knowing this, this is proving that I don't have a, the, the appropriate boarding school education um, I don't want to say telescope. Jesus Christ. Large dome building that looks at stars. Uh, you know, planet, I want to say planetarium, but that's not right. Anyway, St. Paul's has one of those, in addition to numerous private lakes and a Harry Potter castle. Um, so they're imbibed with this, this notion that, uh, you know, they're not elite because they're from wealthy families, they're elite because they work very hard, but the author goes to great lengths to show that they don't really work that hard. Um, they don't really master a lot of this material. Uh, they, they use the cliff notes, they don't read a lot of the stuff that they're required to do, which is not different from students in any number of other places. Um, he's not saying they're more lazy or that they're more dumb, he's just like they're not that exceptional. Um, the mentality at the school is to be that it, the people at the school are the best of the best. So if you're the best, say, hockey player at St. St. John's, or excuse me, St. Paul's, excuse me, St. Paul's, the other students at St. Paul's tend to think that you're the best hockey player in the world. 
for at least for that edge category, whether whatever it is. And he gives multiple examples of you know the the best violin player. People going, oh, is he gonna you know be in the New York Philharmonic? And you know it's, the guy who wrote this book who played violin was like, there's just no way. I mean, he's like a good high school player. You know, good for him, but like he's probably couldn't even make it into Juilliard. You know, not to say that that's like an easy thing to do, but like he's not. He's good, but he's not that good. And and he goes down the list of how this is the case. He goes, you know, none of none of the students go on. I, you know, I listed some of their famous people, but they were famous for being rich and powerful. They weren't famous for being great athletes or great scholars uh, or great or great musicians because there aren't quite there aren't really that many who come from here who end up being that way. The fact that your parents can afford forty thousand dollars a year doesn't mean that you're really great at math or that you're really great at sports. In fact, you're probably not as great at sports as a lot of other people who have have a lot more incentive to be good at it than you do and aren't focused on so many other things. So uh, it's also fascinating and it's, it is very much a system. Uh, talking with this guy who I have talked to him before I read the book and I have not talked to him about reading the book so there's no cross-pollination there in terms of what me having read this and his responses but he expressed kind of a feeling that uh, he was completely he had like no autonomy whatsoever that uh, Everything he did, he did at the behest of his teachers uh, and uh, the staff, the administration of St. Paul's, uh, that they were directing him what classes to take, what to do. And he's already been accepted to Harvard. Um, and that's very interesting because they know this is what you need to do. And they know that it looks good to tell you know someone who's going to write a $40,000 check, hey, if you go here, your kid will probably go to Harvard or Yale or Dartmouth. Um, and... So they make them do these things. And, you know, I want to ask him well, how he thought about the morality of that, if he was ambivalent, if he was happy about it, how he felt not having any autonomy. He was very ambivalent about it. He just accepted that that's the way things are. Um, and, like, this guy is very smart. He speaks uh, French, German, and Arabic uh, on top of English. And, like, the classes that they take there, you know, are not typically what you would find at a high school. He was telling me he's taking um, French cinema, uh, he's taking German 19th century poetry. He's taking Arabic. Yeah, so these are not normal classes that you would take. Um, however, all these, all this information that that they that they learn there, and they don't learn that much information. They learn more how to act like they know a lot, how to act elite, how to act like they're accomplished, how to be at ease uh, in situations with high class people, how to eat a formal dinner, how to interact with managerial staff uh, or, or or business owners. That's a big part of what they're learning there. Um, it's kind of joking. Uh, one of their premier classes that require everyone to take, they have a humanities course uh, that's divided up into three sections, humanities one, two, and three. And uh, he quotes at length from the syllabus of humanities three, uh, which you know mentioned that you learn about European intellectual thought from uh, the medieval period up until uh, you know the Enlightenment. And it talked a lot about Petrarch. And I had never heard of Petrarch except for a week before when Ivan the Heathen, one of my subscribers, had uploaded a long video about Petrarch and his role on modern society. So what this is to say is, I like, guess, it's $40,000 a year. Uh, it's the most elite boarding school in the world. But for $19.95, you can read a book that tells you everything in the course. Because this is the book that Ivan the Heathen is reviewing, right? The Theological Origins of Modernity, which talks all about that. And the kids don't actually learn. It's, it's, it's pretty funny. They, like, they learn how to reference it. They learn how to drop a name. They learn how to say, oh, Spinoza this and Nietzsche that uh, and, and Dostoevsky here. But they don't actually learn that much about them, um, you know, other than to reference them and then to be comfortable in, like, that elite culture. Um, so, fascinating. And again, he says, in the past... Uh, Leeds would distinguish themselves by having refined tastes. Oh, Bach and, and Baroque music and opera uh, and polo. And while that's still something that they're expected to know, it's also expected to that they are what he calls cultural omnivores who, oh, they can also listen to DMC and they can go to see Lady Gaga and they can experience plebeian culture, basically, and that they can be comfortable in that. Um, there's enough egalitarian rhetoric out there that it's no longer considered, you know, becoming of an elite to demean or look down upon um, you know, plebs, basically, uh, that they should be comfortable in plebeian culture. Uh, they should just also be called, uh, comfortable in elite culture. But then kind of the rub is then, 
oh, well, we're more sophisticated, you know, the plebs, they watch Lady Gaga, but they don't go to the Met, and that means that they're not as good as us. However, who can go to the Met? And he talks about, they have the Metropolitan Opera in New York. Students from St. Paul's can, will be given plane tickets and uh, taxi services to go and eat lunch with the people performing, you know, like with Pavarotti, with, you know, people putting on a a show at the Met and then watch the show at the Met and then fly back that same night and then be like, well, you know, anyone can learn about this. And the fact that normal, regular people don't just is an indication of, you know, their, their laziness. And it's like, no, that's not the only reason, but, uh, yeah. So there's, there's, there's definitely a, a sense of, you know, we've, we've worked very hard and like, I think they do work very hard. When I'm talking to my friend, he was a friend, this person, um, I think it's a little early to say we're friends because we've never met, but like was very, you know, they, they clearly do work very hard, but it, it's, it's a question of taking on, you know, the, the traits of somebody who is cultured, who, who knows how to uh, wear a suit, uh, because they have to wear suits, they have formal dinners like all the time. It's so it's, it seems so alien to me, you know, reading about it. But you you have formal dinners uh, with people who have higher authority to you. Now this guy, um, you know, he doesn't like hi hierarchy. He thinks that it's stupid and all that stuff. And I think hierarchy is normal. It exists. There's never been a society where it doesn't. Uh, so I'm not inherently against hierarchy, uh, but I I think that the 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 belief of like innate superiority because of what we do and not the fact that it's the money that's paying for all this uh, is, is interesting. And there, there's another point I think to be made here that's a little bit broader. Um, in the last book that I read about uh, the Republican Party before the Civil War, it talked very briefly about, and this wasn't a topic of the book, but how one of the main reasons the this, this Civil War happened was because the South was worried that they were going to lose their political power within the Union. Um, you know, they had dominated national politics for a long time. So many presidents had come from the South, so many senators, so many chief justices, so many generals. And this was slowly changing. As the 19th century progressed, uh, the Industrial Revolution was much more centered in New England and in the West, but in the North, not in the South, you know. And the population was booming much more in the, in the North. It was much more industrious. And many people recognized this, and many people in the South, and they feared the loss of their status and of their relative power within the union. And the solution, and this isn't the only you know, consideration that went into this, but the solution was we should leave the union so that we can, you know, retain our status in our own, our own country. Um, what was interesting is in the book, he talks about how the loss of status and loss of power within the state doesn't necessarily imply secession. He goes, after all, New England also lost power within the state. You know, early on, New England was where everything was at. And then through the 19th century, the growth of the Western states in the Midwest initially, you know, places like, like Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania, well, Pennsylvania is kind of old, but like uh, Illinois, but then later uh, states like Texas and then, of course, the West Coast, uh, the, the relative importance of New England, which are, after all, small states with relatively limited populations, decreased enormously. And he said, well, look, New England has, uh, you know, they didn't, uh, they didn't secede. So obviously, you know, uh, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. They seem to have accepted there. But I think New England was much cleverer than the South was. Uh, New England took its values and its, um, its moors, its, its ethics, its view on the world, its epistemology, its eschatology, and created the highest status institutions in the country, indeed some of the highest status institutions in the world, namely the Ivy League schools and their supporting boarding schools, uh, whether it be Harvard or Yale or Dartmouth or St. Paul's or Groton or Exeter uh, or Brown. And these schools became the par excellence, the elite, of the entire continent. There is the, the, the mystique of Harvard is not to be found at Berkeley or Stanford or the University of Chicago. Regardless of the, the academic uh, excellence or, or even supremacy that those other schools might have in this or that field. Uh, and so the cultural 
control, the cultural influence at least, if not control, uh, of New England and of the puritanical ethic uh, has been extended well beyond the economic power of these of these states of New Hampshire. Uh, St. Paul's is in New Hampshire, right? Right. How much economic power could New Hampshire possibly have? Well, it has Dartmouth. It has it has Dartmouth. It has Groton. It has Exeter. It has Andover, and it has uh, St. Paul's. Uh, Massachusetts is a small state, tiny small state, but it has Harvard, you know, and, and, and Connecticut has Yale, and Rhode Island, smallest state of all, has Brown, you know, and these, th there are no other, th this constellation, this concentration um, of cultural c capital, especially of the elite, uh, is not to be found anywhere else, if not in the country, certainly not in the world. Uh, well, if not in the world, at least in the country. Excuse me. Uh, you could uh, you could argue things like uh, Cambridge and, and Oxford, perhaps, uh, are relative rivals, and who knows? Maybe some of the schools in China or whatever, but I, I doubt it. Um, they they just don't have have the pedigree. Um, and I see, you know, obviously the Ivy League schools of today don't preach the uh, pure you know, the puritanism of the Pilgrims uh, or Plymouth Colony uh, any longer. That 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 sort of uh, uh, theology is long gone, and indeed the theology has, in a long ways, has, has has morphed into a kind of a secular theology. But many elements of it are still there, and those elements include very strongly the idea that uh, the world could be made better through the control and the works of an enlightened elite, uh, people who just know better, and this mentality is spewed out of these institutions, whether it be from uh, the gay communist that I went on a date with who really honestly thinks he knows what's best for everyone. This guy's never worked a day in his life. He's never had a nine to five. He's never cleaned a toilet. He's uh, never owned a car. He's, uh, you know, but he knows, you know, how much health care you should have, what kind of job you should have. Uh, how much you should get paid, how much of your wages should go towards health care, how much should go towards recreation, what types of recreation are the best, what types of remuneration are appropriate or inappropriate, and all number of other hubristic, uh, absurd, arbitrary, subjective pr preferences on his behalf that he thinks that are good for everyone. And I, it's it's the gay communist I met, but it's Mark Zuckerberg too. You know, the guy who can go and if, this, if the allegations are true and this is kind of... Um, you know, an illustrative, if somewhat topical, uh, contemporary reference uh, to editing, you know, Facebook and saying, uh, you know, conservatives, not that I am one, uh, their opinions should not be uh, spread as much as liberals because they're obviously wrong and we know what's best for everyone. Um, this kind of will to, to dominate and to rule and to guide and to shape, to look at people as uh, inferior to you, though, and so deserving of your control is uh, a powerful impulse that is perpetuated by these institutions and their own status is what gives it legitimacy right uh, his opinion matters and isn't worthless because uh, he goes to Harvard he teaches at Harvard he went to Harvard he went to a, a, a school like this and you know if anyone you know thinks he he's wrong and that he might be incorrect about that your educational pedigree um, doesn't compare to his, and so he can speak to you with authority about these issues. Now, that's an argument from authority, and so it's a fallacy, but it's a persuasive fallacy, and one that has um, lent so much credence to so many bad ideas that it's a joke. And so, well, I think there's much to be said about the pedagogy of some of these schools in terms of, you know, encouraging physical behavior, you know, physical prowess, and, and a wide range of studies in the humanities and whatnot, or music. Um, I, I, I tend to think that there aren't um, universal best pedagogies for everyone. I think that's kind of silly. I think we all have uh, not only different aptitudes and different interests, but different goals, and that, uh, you know, an ideal education would be tailored to those, and that, by and large, most people don't require direct formal education um, that much, if at all. Uh, I think other types of education are probably sufficient, if not superior, um, certainly most cost-effective, uh, in the vast majority of cases, which is not to deny that there aren't certain times and in certain situations and for certain people where a formal education or a formal education environment might make sense or might be useful, and indeed a boarding school environment might make sense or might be useful. Not denying that they don't have a place, 
I am denying, though, that they convey the right to rule or the knowledge to rule or the ability to rule. Uh, and that's what they convey, at least the conceit to believe that you can do those things. Uh, so the students will walk away from this with the profound self-assurance that they are the elite, that they have the right and the will and the ability and the prerogative to tell everyone else what's best for them. Um, and I think that's very, very interesting. Um, you know, and the, not that the analogy, not that it's perfectly analogous, and, you know, this is stream of consciousness is just coming to my head right now, so it might be complete bullshit, but, uh, you know, the idea that someone could pass an uh, eight legged essay in uh, Ming, China, for instance, uh, and, and demonstrate their knowledge of the Analects by Confucius or Mencius. Uh, that that would mean that they are qualified to run and manage and govern a province with a million people uh, is ridiculous. Uh, it would be ridiculous if he even was taking courses in engineering and civil engineering, history, politics, math, and economics. It's even more ridiculous when he's learning about you know the Analects. Uh, not to detract from the Analects, but just to say knowledge of them does not convey the necessary skills to rule as if those even exist. Uh, but the students at these schools uh, come away with that impression that, that uh, they, they believe that and they convey that. And then when they go to Harvard and they continue to believe that and then they can walk around the rest of their life saying, I have a Harvard degree and so you have to listen to me. Um, not so many words, but that's kind of the thing. So anyway, it's an interesting side topic. I had no idea that I would be researching a boarding school. I don't expect to continue researching it, at least through books uh, at, at any point in the future, although he did reference some other stuff that I agree in uh, that I thought might be interesting. Um, and the guy has a lot of things that I don't agree with. Um, just one quick, you know, he keeps talking about, well, people are... Uh, you know, uh, structural, what did he call, uh, durable inequalities. You know, durable inequalities is what, you know, prevents people from rising in society. And if you read Thomas Sowell's book, you know, he points out that what creates wealth, what determines not only income but wealth, is a myriad of things. And to just say, well, it's just, it, even, let's accept for the moment that there are, you know, durable inequalities, that there maybe is structural racism. We, we, you know, we, those are debatable, but let's, for the sake of argument, assume that they're, that they're legitimately real things. They would only be a component. You know, Sol points out, Sol points out, points out in his book, it's not enough to say uh, there an injustice occurred, therefore that explains why you are poor. Why you are poor, that might be a factor, but there's a thousand other factors, and to just ignore them all and put it Put it, pin, it, pin it all on your sociological theory, even if it's a theory that might have some validity, is totally erroneous. And, you know, reading this book, I couldn't help but think that repeatedly. However, the insight into the um, pedagogy and the culture of the school was still very worthwhile, so I had a good time reading it. Anyway, uh, that's pretty much it, and I hope you all have a good night. Or day, if you happen to watch it, not night.